Good morning. Welcome to the fall Karen Calling uh, luncheon. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, your ministry to your caregivers is important not only to them, but to the whole congregation as it builds community. It's linking us together with people who are less able to be with us sometimes in person. And it just reminds them that God's love is always with them. But that's only possible because you, the caregivers, are the ones who are making those connections, bringing your body, your heart, your big listening ears, and your very selves to these relationships. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Stephanie Cavanaugh. She is a member of our congregation, a professor of psychiatry at Rush University. She is an attending physician at Rush University Medical Center and Northwestern Medical Center. Stephanie ran a program of that dual trained residents in medicine, psychiatry, and neurology. She is the director of psychiatric consultation services at Rush. Her research interests include depression in medical inpatient and outpatient settings, training non psychiatric residents to recognize and treat depression. We are so glad that she has prepared a program for us today, looking at a lay caregiving program such as ours, Karen Calling, from the perspective of a psychiatrist. How unique and yet how important that is to bring that perspective uh, to our Karen Calling program and ministry at Winnetka Congregational Church. I present to you Dr. Stephanie Kavanaugh. Thank you very much for having me. I spent a lot of time in this church. Uh, my grandparents went to church here. My parents went to church here. And they are presently in the back, residing uh, for, uh, for, for a long period of time, or forever, of course. And uh, my uh, children went here, uh, were in Sunday school here. They were confirmed here. And my daughter was married by Reverend Schenk here. And then uh, I was also an usher here and sang in the choir. So uh, I've been here a good deal of time. And uh, further, my husband and my sister and I will be buried in the back here. And many of the rest of my family, we have nine other slots, so to speak. So um, anyway, I think just to be said, that what you do is so wonderful. Your the caring calling that you do <laughs> is so important to these people that you visit. And if you've done the work that I've done in the hospital and you know you send somebody home and they may have no family members or the family members are not attentive, having somebody from the church that visits really makes all the difference in the world in terms of their life. So I thank you very much for what you do. Um, now, my perspective may be a little bit different than what your perspective is. And I hope that what I have to say will help you in your care and calling. Um, but again, it may be quite different than what you do. So uh, when I was asked to give this talk, um, there were a number of questions that many of you asked, and I thought maybe I could incorporate some of them into what I was going to say. I can't do all of it, and uh, otherwise this would last an hour, and so there wouldn't be any time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing is, what is the difference between a psychiatrist and other mental health professionals? Now, a psychiatrist is a, a doctor who's had four years of medical school, one year of internship, and usually three years of residency. And they evaluate people with mental illness and uh, provide treatment for them, usually medication, uh, psychotropic medication, but also they may integrate that with the medical care that the patient has. Um, additionally, uh, they may either do psychotherapy. I do most of my own psychotherapy, but many people refer to a psychologist. And 
there are many times that I also work with psychologists. Now, psychologists have two-year two master's degree uh, in clinical psychology or their PhDs, clinical PhDs, and they have more training. Um, now, also social workers will do psychotherapy. And the work that I did for 43 years uh, was training uh, non-psychiatric physicians to provide, I would say, mental health care for their patients. And um, so internists, family practitioners, some ob doctors um, are able to diagnose and treat, not the psychotherapy, but the medical part, uh, treat patients who have mental disorders. Not serious ones, but, but less serious ones. And now with it being very difficult often to find a psychiatrist, uh, very often the primary care doctor is giving the psychotropic medications to the patients and uh, a therapist is taking care of their uh, psychotherapeutic needs. Um, and then uh, nurse practitioners and advanced practice nurses uh, can actually evaluate and treat and they will take patients that are less severely ill, have less severely ill uh, mental problems, and then refer to the psych psychiatry because it's very, very complicated. And obviously, ordained ministers with training in pastoral care do a great deal of work as well with patients, particularly in the hospital where I worked. Uh, I was so grateful for the uh, ordained ministers that helped us in the intensive care unit and other places where people were so ill, dying, and uh, had, well, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> so let me go on. And um, what I'm gonna do today is talk about the causes, diagnosis, and treatment of depression, which might be helpful in uh, care and calling. Um, one of the things I'd like to really emphasize is depression and medical illness are really highly correlated. In other words, if somebody is medically ill, they are much more likely to have a depression than others in the uh, environment. Um, and if somebody is depressed, they are more likely to get physically ill. So, for example, somebody with bipolar disorder or somebody with schizophrenia will live approximately 10 to 20 less years than uh, a person that does not have bipolar disorder or uh, schizophrenia. Uh, depression is more common or severe than those that are more severely ill, are disabled, have significant discomfort and pain, have lost a spouse or significant relationships. And Sally and I were talking today about how important our close friends are and that nobody really uh, mourns them like family members. But I think as we get older, a loss of a close, a close friend is a very significant loss. Um, and uh, also people that have had uh, significant loss of their activity, social support, and loneliness are more likely to be depressed. And those with very significant stressors tend to be more likely to be depressed, as we all know. Um, people can stand so much and then they get depressed or anxious. Okay. Now, anybody who's been depressed here, we all have had bouts of it, I'm quite sure. No, that is not a lovely experience. So it's as, as much as we can, it's important to try to get a person some medication and try to get them to psycho, some psychotherapy so, so they feel better. Um, and clearly it decreases the quality of one's life. It increases the use of medical services because people that are depressed are more likely to go to the doctor for something that might not be a bona fide medical illness. 
um, and they will have increased severity of pain. Now that's not physiological, but the more depressed you are, if you have pain, the more pain you have. And you have to really treat both the depression as well as the pain in order for the patient to get better, not just the depression. That doesn't, doesn't help with the pain. You also have to treat the pain. Um, and it can cause disability in people. And that means all the things that they don't do anymore and their inability to care for themselves as well as they did. Um, to the point that it's almost the equivalent of a chronic medical illness for very for moderately to severely depressed patients. And obviously, as you know from your care and calling, there's less interaction with usual activities, family, friends, or other social supports. And finally, people that have a personal history or family history of depression obviously are more likely to get depressed with all the stressors and all the things I talked about than somebody that has not, does not have that predisposition. Now, here's uh, severe depression increases medical problems and mortality. And that's in a direct effect on the body, okay? Uh, there are some very interesting studies that have shown that depression can lead to increase in cardiac complications following a myocardial infarction, or the people that had a cardiac event are more likely to die if they're depressed. And it's, it's a dose effect. In other words, the more depressed the person is, the more likely this is to happen. Um, or it can indir indirectly result in the person being non-compliant with medical care. And of course, that makes sense to you. Um, and depression may lead to behavior that really discourages people from helping them when they're ill. Like they say, oh, don't take me to the doctor, or they don't call the doctor. Or um, they do things to put people off so they really don't want to uh, help them with their medical care. Um, I'd say, uh, Depression may result, obviously, and this is very obvious, you've seen this in your care and calling, that, that patients um, who are depressed are less likely to reorder their medications or get diagnostic tests. Um, they often don't make another medical appointment or keep medical appointments so they don't feel like going. They don't take their medications as prescribed. Uh, they can't remember what the doctor said. They can't follow directions because they have decreased attention and concentration and memory as a result of the depression. And uh, often they don't drink fluids, they get dehydrated, they're hospitalized. And this can result in deterioration of the medical problem and even death. Now, I worked in a hospital, so I saw so many people that were admitted to the hospital because they're depressed and didn't take care of themselves. And uh, with some of those with age-appropriate cognitive change or mild dementia, it decreases their cognitive functioning and actually can cause confusion. And uh, the most common, one of the most common causes of admission to a medical unit, not the ICU, is that somebody didn't take care of themselves properly. And they come in with something called mental status changes. Um, so, Taking care of yourself is really important. I think everybody in this room knows that, but the people that you see to encourage them in that area is always a good idea. Uh, depression can be caused by a medical illness directly, okay? And that's really important. And um, medical drugs, side effects between medical drugs and over-the-counter medications can also cause depression. So it's really important if somebody gets depressed, that they see their doctor and, doc and the doctor rules out the causes of depression. Uh, and all depressed patients should have their primary care doctor uh, rule things out. And sometimes the doctor that, you know, I kind of go to the doctor or when I've asked them to go to the doctor, the doctor says, well, I don't, I don't really understand 
why you're here. And they say, well, my psychiatrist told me to check out uh, whether there's some organic cause of, of the depression. And there are literally a ton of things like uh, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, um, various kinds of cancers can physiologically cause depression. And there are, there's just a ton of things. There are about 120 things, which I usually give to the medical students and the people I train. Oh, did, you, did you want to add that slide as you were? Oh, okay. I forgot about that. Oh, okay. We have to go fairly fast. Yeah. Um, it would be a good idea. So far, it doesn't make a good difference. Good. This is important. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so, as you can see, there is an interaction among all of these things, which I think is obvious to all of you. In other words, stressors, medical problems, family problems, work problems, physical problems. And these are a lot of the symptoms that people have when they have a, a more severe depression. There are negative thoughts, low self esteem, sadness, helplessness. That also adds to it. And then there's a change in, in behavior. And I think that you can see that all of those things interact with the other person. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Oops. All right. Now, this is a very difficult slide. And I'm going to move up to the podium if I need to do it. Um, you have a handout here in which I did a much better job of all this. <laughs> of all the signs and symptoms of depression and how you can ask the questions. If you if you went and, and you were talking to somebody that was depressed, it would allow you to ask the questions that occur with people that are depressed in such a way that you could do it um, in a way that they do not feel that you've intruded upon them, but have asked them a question and then there's a follow-up question. And what I did, I'm gonna present a case in a while. It's what I did as I have the case there and then I have the person's name uh, is George Smith. I thought that was a good name. <laughs> and it shows his responses. He, he's less depressed and what people that have some mild symptoms of depression how they would answer the questions as well. Okay, so let's start here. So depressed mood. Now I want to I want to differentiate between depressed mood that is mild and depressed mood that is severe. Okay, because I think that's really important. All of us have had mild depression. Maybe some people haven't. It's very rare. All right. So when one has a depressed mood and a mild depression. There is present only some of the time. Whereas with severely depressed people, depression is predominant and persistent. Okay. Um, people that are mildly really sad feel better with usual activity or social interaction. You know, somebody wakes up feeling crummy in the morning and then they go see their friend or go take a walk or do something. Uh, but with, with more severely depressed people, it's there most of the time, not only when they're alone, and there's loss of interest in people. And that's a very important thing. Uh, losing interest in people uh, is one of the things in my research I found is the one thing that goes up. If, you, some, if somebody's sick or not mobile or they're uh, having trouble with attention and concentration, uh, they may not be uh, doing those things as much, doing the, the things they normally do as much as possible. But if they lose interest in people, their family, whatever, then that is a serious thing. Okay. Um, loss of interest or pleasure in activities. Usually it's mild. Uh, and uh, but if, it, if a person is depressed, there's decrease of interest, of interest or pleasure 
in many activities, most days, which is very important, including loss of interest in their family and their friends. Um, and of course, the person that is mildly depressed is very social interaction in many activities, but not all of them. Um, helplessness. Uh, people that are mildly depressed are, are mildly discouraged about the future, but they aren't hopeless or helpless. And over here, we are uh, more severely, severely depressed patient is discouraged about the future and feels hopeless and helpless. And this is a very bad thing. Somebody that's profoundly depressed and they express these feelings because this is highly correlated with suicide ideation. You can imagine this. Um, and cognitive symptoms of depression, mild difficulty with decisions and attention and concentration. All of you know, if you're upset about something and thinking about it, that you don't put down memories as easily as possible. You don't concentrate as well. And, and I, I think that people say, well, how come you didn't remember that? And then there is difficulty with decisions. And I always thought that was a weird thing, that people that were depressed had difficulty with decisions, but they do. Because I think they've lost often lost confidence in their ability to make a decision, or they just don't, they're too depressed to make a decision. And then <clears throat> finally, in the more severe depression, there's diminished ability to think or concentrate, and that's due to the disorder, and moderate to severe difficulty with decisions. And um, here the people feel a little guilt or feeling bad about themselves unless they grew up feeling extraordinarily guilty all their life and then they continue to be guilty. Uh, and I think, and they feel bad about the situation rather than themselves. And you remember Morning in Melancholy by Freud? Okay, but anyway, Freud said that, um, that people that are mourning feel good about themselves. But people that are melancholic or depression feel bad about themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, cognitive depression, uh, cognitive symptoms of depression, we just talked about that difficulty that diminish the ability to think and concentrate, moderate to severe difficulty with decision, feels worthless. And one of the big questions I used to always ask patients was Does God love you? Yes or no? Has God deserted you or Jesus or whoever is most important to them? And they'll say, yes, God, God has deserted me. God doesn't love me anymore. I'm so guilty, God. God can't possibly love me. And then, of course, you've all seen, and I'm sure you've seen this more commonly, other people that feel that they're so angry with God for what's happened to them that they won't have anything to do with God. That's a little different than this. Okay. And then finally, uh, mild to moderate feelings of guilt, um, feelings that loss and illness are a punishment for wrongdoings. And then finally, mild, moderate to severe suicidal ideation. We'll talk about that in a minute. And significant agitation or retardation. Now, if you are calling on somebody, and they're really agitated. Normally, they, uh, you know, they look a particular way, and all of a sudden they're pacing around, doing this, they're fidgeting, they can't sit still, uh, they're, they're kind of jumping around, and and they look as if they're agitated. Then you can ask them, do you feel an agitated, do you feel agitated inside, do you feel anxious inside? And then over here is the person who is slowed down and really, I don't know if I can do it, but you know, they look slower, you know, slower, slowed down, and then they have they have decreased range of affect. And you've seen people that are depressed, and you can you walk and you walk, you see friends, you see other people who are depressed, and you know it immediately what a person looks like that's depressed. Okay, so that's 
That's important. And then, um, let me remember what now I have. Not quite far. I can say, thank you. Okay. Um, now these are associated uh, symptoms. Um, and th these have to follow the onset of the depressive symptoms. There are many of us who have had trouble sleeping all our lives, right? Uh, and would love to stay, in, or people that would love to stay in bed uh, more and not get up. But these are changes that occur after the person becomes depressed, right? Uh, mild or, or, or rare severe insomnia is not reaching the same bed. Patient has a good appetite, may have a slight decrease or increase. Many people who are depressed eat a lot. Minimal weight gain or loss and mild loss of energy or fatigue. Obviously not related to medical illness. And then moderate to severe depression, uh, the person may have total insomnia, where they don't sleep all night, or they have trouble going to sleep, they wake up early, sleeping too much, trouble getting out of bed. Some people just can't even get out of bed anymore. Significant decrease or increase in appetite or weight loss or weight gain, and significant loss of energy or fatigue. Next slide, please. All right. Now, demoralization is a very interesting thing. So, is it going to be too ugly? Oh, okay. Suicidal thinking. What happened to suicidal thinking? Okay, it's not there. There it is. Is it? Okay. Um, <coughs> this is very serious, and hopefully, you don't encounter it, but you might have a chance when you go to visit somebody and they are suicidal. This is recurrent, um, recurrent thoughts of death, recurrent thoughts of suicide without a specific plan, or a suicide attempt, or a specific plan for committing suicide. And this is not a specific plan to end physical suffering. We know at the end of life, uh, I used to work in hospice for a long time in, the, in people's homes. And um, Many people would have a stash of medication that they could use to take when the time came that they felt that their life was over. And so, or not, or so these are people that are very ill, they're close to death. And that is, if one talks about that as a plan to end suffering in hospice, I think that's often dealt with by the hospice doctor or the hospice nurses. Um, have you felt so bad sometimes you think about ending your life? Okay. How would that help? Now, this is a crazy question. How would killing yourself help? Many people that are depressed say, it puts me out of my misery. I don't have to feel like this anymore. Or, or that, you know, that they could just be at peace. Um, that they're such a bad person they should be dead. There are many things people tell you. But how would you help as an interest? interesting question. It gives you a much better idea of what their suffering is and why they want to go ahead and harm themselves. And have you thought about ways of harming yourself? Do you have a gun? Do you have the pills to kill yourself? And it's nice to get rid of those things as quickly as possible from the house. Uh, if the person says yes, see if they have the means available to them. And as I just said, try to get rid of it. Have you tried to harm yourself? And very often people that are suicidal will have done something recently to try to harm themselves and nobody knows about it. So if this happens, I think I hope you would agree with this, maybe you won't. Stay with the person, do not leave, and uh, either call one of the, the, the ministers to come help you out. Uh, and if it's really bad, uh, call 911 and have them taken to the hospital for, you got, for an evaluation. But I would like you to comment on that. Exactly right. Uh, when you and I talked on the phone right. a couple weeks ago, um, I mentioned that 
something in care and calling we all know. If care and calling ministers have any questions, who do you call? Or Carol. And we will advise you if you feel over your head, any kind of critical situation like Stephanie's describing, reach out. 911 if it's yeah, if it's 911 if it's uh, if it's, if it's imminent. If you feel it, if you feel it's an emergency, yeah. medical or whatever, call 911. That's part of our care and calling training yeah. also. Yeah. So, Don't be afraid to call 911. Uh, the, it's better to call 911 and not have needed to than the other way around, wishing later you had made that call. I hope you both have our cell phone numbers because that, that could be really, really helpful. Yeah. Okay. We now, got uh, 25 minutes. Well, I'm almost done. So. Oh, oh, carry on. Oh, awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll be done in about 10 minutes. Okay. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Is this one, the one more? No, 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 no. Do we miss one? Yeah, just. Okay. Oh, there's, oh, it's after that one. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, jumping, jumping around. Sorry. Okay. No. No. Go to the next one. There we go. Demoralization is a very interesting phenomenon. And it's a crisis in meaning. It's, it's commonly confused with depression. It differs from major, a major depressive episode if the mood is misconstrued, as we were talking before. The patients say they are not depressed, but demoralized, discouraged, overwhelmed. Things are not going to improve. Are unable to figure out how to cope with an overwhelming circumstance. It's a normal human response to overwhelming circumstances, to physical illness, which prevent the patient's mood, enjoyment, or hope. Are immediately at my side in which patients' mood, enjoyment, and hope are immediately restored when the adversity is removed. And you've seen this in people that were not medically ill, that were so overwhelmed. You know, their son dies in suicide, their wife has just died. Um, I mean, all these horrible things have happened to them at once. And if the person could change that at that moment, then they would feel better. Um, it does not include the bank medication medication demoralization. And the treatment is directed toward ameliorating the physical and emotional stressors and strengthening the patient's resilience to stress. Okay, so, so the uh, psychotherapy remains the same, but the antidepressant medication basically is Okay. Um, next. Good. Uh, most studies show that mild depressive symptoms are best treated with psychotherapy. Surprise, surprise. And a lot of people will use others in the environment, their best friends to talk to, and very often that may be enough. Uh, but when it is not, uh, psychotherapy will be important. And moderate and severe depression or prolonged depression is best treated and has the most response to psychotherapy and antidepressant medication. Okay, so mild depression, if it's if, if it's prolonged, giving a antidepressant plus psychotherapy is a good idea. If the person is extremely depressed, the studies show that they have to have medication plus psychotherapy. And just medication alone is not doing the job, regardless of what some people might say. The drug company. <laughs> okay. Now, spiritual involvement. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Spiritual involvement and spirituality are associated with better coping with stress, less severe severity and early remission of depression. So if you're depressed and you have spiritual care, you're gonna get better things. Uh, and it'll be less severe. That's good news. Um, less suicide, less anxiety, and less depression. And they did this very cool study um, a couple of years ago. One of my colleagues did it. They did an 18 year study of 
of 6,905 patients. Now that's a lot of patients. Age 8, 25 to 74, that showed that religious attendance and overall religious spirituality score and a sense of meaning in their life was associated with study subjects being alive after 18 years. In other words, it prolonged their life, which is fascinating. And they showed that people that were in this category lived 10 years longer than other people that didn't have spiritual involvement which is, and had meaning to their life. Kind of an interesting thing. Um, I use a serenity prayer a lot. And even if people are not um, very involved religiously, because I think it, it's helpful for people. And with dealing with loss, give me the courage to accept what cannot be changed. And that's very important in dealing with loss and helping people work that through. Reframing and problem solving. Give me the courage to accept what cannot be changed, but the courage to change what must be changed. Is that that is that wrong there? Sorry, I, I, oh, I just got this slide. I'm sorry if that's my mistake. So it really means give me the courage to accept what cannot be changed, and it's give me the change to give me the courage to change what must be changed. Okay, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I think that's really helpful with cancer patients, you know, or with somebody that's lost somebody. How are you going to accept what happened? How are you going to change what you can change? And let's talk about how you tell the difference between the two. Okay. And you all know this right there, don't you? Yes, no? Yes. Okay. Now there's a guy named David Burns who <laughs> was my medical student. And um, he, he had a father who was a pastor. And the pastor, his father, made everybody feel so good, helped them cope with so many things. And he was a wonderful guy. So, so David really didn't want to be a minister, but he became a psychiatrist. And he wanted to write a self-help book that would be as good at helping people as his father was from the pulpit or in his pastoral care. I'm not quite sure if he was quite good as father from a pastoral point of view, but he did use a lot of what his father had taught him. And the book is called Feeling Good. It's in the New Mood Therapy at 797 at, at Amazon. And you can get it in probably two days. And 1495 in Kindle. There's also an audio one. And then he wrote a new one just recently called Feeling Great for Anxiety and Depression. I thought maybe I should read that. So um, I, I haven't read it, so I can't recommend it. Okay. Now, all there's a huge amount of research on what psychotherapy works. And um, next slide. Um, the first is increased active coping and problem solving. People with mild depression need help in doing problem solving. Anybody that's, that's mildly depressed or depressed needs help with active coping and problem solving. Cognitive therapy, one identifies and modified negative thinking that contribute to depression. And I think all of you, when you walk out of church, hopefully uh, you begin to feel more positively, you hope, right? It'd be okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we want to focus on people's accomplishments. When, when people are depressed, when they're ill, um, you know, remembering that they had some accomplishments, that they were good mothers, that they were good grandmothers, that they were, they did good things in their life is very helpful. Um, uh, and help them increase the frequency of pleasant activities. I would say, I want you to write down what you can do that's pleasant. That's not the, that's not loading the dishwasher, emptying the dishwasher, or doing your checkbook. I want you to uh, increase frequency of pleasant pleasant activities and activate social networks and increase social supports. I know you guys do a lot of that stuff. So yeah. Okay. Very important. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, increase family communication and problem solving. You know, families sometimes 
kind of lose the ability to do that, particularly if the kids live out of town. And I know you guys do that a lot. Increase activity. This is a hard one, particularly if the person doesn't have too much they like to do, <laughs> they're unable to move around. And um, so that's, that's kind of a problem, but it's something that you need to think about with the person. Finding ways to increase physical functioning and compliance uh, and participation in medical care. And sometimes people that are depressed don't want to do anything. So, uh, you know, encourage walking if they can uh, and other kinds of physical activity. We all know that makes us feel better, right? Um, and increase spiritual and religious coping. Now, here's my friend, George. Now, George, yes. George is a 73-year-old retired lawyer whose wife died two years ago of cancer of the breast. He was her caretaker prior to her death. And he's a really kind of a resilient guy when you hear about everything. He has three grown children who live in Colorado, California, and Philadelphia. All are married and has two children. All grown children and spouses work and have busy lives. So they can't just rush right over and visit George uh, by plane. Until recently, uh, following his wife's test, he visited them twice a year. And they visited once a year, given the family's complex visits. I'm sure all of you have children and grandchildren like that. Um, many of his friends, he and his wife knew have moved away. One of his best male friends died recently. He lives in the house he grew up and he's able to manage it. So he's really quite resilient. Um, he has a history of taking antidepressants or, or anxiety and depression in his 40s when working 80 hours a week, attempting to be a husband and a father. A psychiatrist prescribed an antidepressant and a psychologist did psychotherapy. It was very successful for him. These were helpful and after a year he stopped the antidepressant and therapy. So this shows us that George has responded, you know, he relates well to a therapist and he will res probably respond to medication if needed. He attended a group for spouses providing, provided by the cancer center when his wife was ill, which was helpful, which shows that social support is really going to help him. Most recently, he had trouble ambulating with problems with his hips and knees. Oh, dear, it sounds like me. <laughs> which has made traveling by plane difficult. I take my husband in a wheelchair, you know, everywhere a year ago. Now he's better, but it really is difficult. And I don't know how he would have done it by himself. Uh, he, uh, the person had a right hip replacement, which was successful, but now he has pain in his other hip and his knee swells when he walks. This is, this, this is the problem with people that were football players, I think. And, caught, and he uses a cane for stabilization. His visits to children have become infrequent since traveling by plane is difficult. Now, medically, he has what most men have over a certain age. He has high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and then later on, atrial fibrillation. Uh, he has a medication for high cholesterol and two blood thinners and two and, and a blood pressure medic, two blood pressure medications, a blood thinner. He has a medication which you think is metropolol which makes him tired. Most recently, he was hospitalized for a stent replacement uh, following an episode of chest pain. This really scared the thickens out of him and has really made him feel like a lot more vulnerable. Um, he drinks plenty of water. I talked to you about dehydration. Orders out a lot and eats many frozen entrees. He, what, his doctor wants him to restrict his sodium, which is difficult given his diet. And, I might say that his wife always cooked very healthy meals for him. Uh, he has one Manhattan nightly, which is having chewing as long as he remembers, nothing more, he doesn't drink too much. He reads the newspaper. He has some word finding problems and has um, some age appropriate cognitive changes, right? He keeps careful notes and an appointment book and is sometimes forgetful. Nonetheless, he's able to function fairly well in caring for himself and social interactions. He has bifocals and hearing aids, which he is often misplacing. 
misplacing, causing visual and auditory <laughs> difficulty. We all know about that, right? Okay. Um, at present, he has age appropriate cognitive changes. Having glasses and hearing aids are important for him to accurately interact with the environment. If a visitor, this is another question that you asked, if a visitor were to find George confused, the most obvious cause would be medical or medication. All right. And uh, he should see his primary care doctor to immediately, and you should figure out how to get that done. And then the most common cause, interestingly, of admission to the hospital for confusion of somebody like looking like you and me is dehydration or a urinary tract infection. <laughs> Interesting. If you are a water drinker, you come on. Okay. He attended church, next slide, for it sporadically in his younger years due to his work schedule, but attended all holidays and important church functions. His children uh, attended Sunday school here, and since retirement and during his wife's illness, he's attended church regularly and received helpful support from the church. And this is important, at least for me, because this shows me that, that spiritual care is important to him. Most recently, he sought the assistance of ministers. He was feeling more alone, having less meaning in his life, more vulnerable, and somewhat down. It was suggested that he have a visitor from the church, which he felt would be useful. Okay. All right, so in summary, George has mild symptoms of depression, which that would best be treated with psychotherapy combined with spiritual report, support. Since he has had depression in the past, an antidepressant should be considered if his depression persists or becomes more severe. I would say the most important thing would be to try to prevent George from becoming more depressed or demoralized, if we possibly could. Okay, now I'm not gonna go through all of this, but this deals with his medical problems. And says the most important thing to do, if he hasn't already done it himself, is to encourage him to go see his primary care doctor and get his control for all changed and see if there's anything medically that is contributing to his depression. The other problem is uh, his lack of mobility is really a problem. And he's got a lot of pain. And you know, all of us know that the best medicine for depression and anxiety is exercise, right? And to feel good. Well, this is kind of hard for him. So, and it's also preventing him from seeing his children and uh, social interactions. So physical therapy and then figuring out how he can have increased his physical activity through consulting with the physical therapist would be helpful with that. And that is primary care doctor has to write a prescription for. And active problem solving with his family to increase more time with his family, increasing meaningful and pleasurable activities, increasing social network, increasing social supports, uh, and increasing religious and spiritual coping to help with the loneliness and loss would be important. I'm done. No. <laughs> so I have no summary. You can ask me any questions you like. And then, then you have your handout in your hand. And I think that you'll see that this goes through uh, the signs and symptoms of depression, but much more carefully. And you can see in there that it tells you how to ask the question. All right. Okay. I hope we have, we're good. We're we done. About 10 minutes. We're done. So. So uh, if, and so that's why I gave that to you. You can read it through and uh, see what minutes. George has to say about those. What George has to say about so we have about 10 minutes for conversation. So if uh, anything you'd like to ask me, I'd be very, most happy to answer. No one wants to ask me questions. No. Sure. Steve, Steve, Steve. Steve. Yes. So um, in this George case, you, you mentioned that he was on a drug and that might need to be reevaluated. Yeah. And one of the things I was reading recently was that um, 
antidepressive drugs are often prescribed, but then remain as a part of a regimen for the patient long after they, yeah, they may be needed and their, uh, I guess, emerging data around how long it really takes to get safely off of some of these yeah. drugs. How, how, how do you think about that? That's a good question. Time? Okay. Um, with mild depression, often people can take an antidepressant for a short period of time. Um, but with more severe depression, uh, particularly people that have a history of chronic recurrent depression, what happens is that they, uh, if you stop the medication, they are more likely to have a recurrence of depression. Now, if you go way back when I first started practicing, we would often decrease the medication and the antidepressant after the episode was over, but the newest research shows that often they will have a recurrence of depression. I try to keep the medication as low as I can so the person doesn't have a recurrence, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to stop an antidepressant, if you're like me, I'm a very careful doctor. So I, I try, I usually will decrease it by a little bit every month, mm -hmm. slowly, until they're off the medication uh, so that they we can check whether they're going to have a recurrence. Is it in that time frame that you would, is that a two month or is it six months? How, is it... it really depends on how long they've been on it, how severe their depression has been, okay. what's going on now, what the patient wants to do. Mm -hmm. Many patients um, might like to get off their medication, but they're terrified because they've been so sick. They've been so miserable. Okay. Other questions? And, and would anyone at home like to uh, give a comment or a question? <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourself and do so. Um, Lois, you've had a comment. Hi, Lois. Yes, we've been hearing for years about the overwhelming um, problems of opioids. Oh, yes. And this has to tie in with what you've been dealing with, I'm sure. How do you deal with the problem of perhaps one person going to various doctors and accumulating this problem until they kill them. Well, presently, any uh, thing that any any medication that uh, is has to be approved by a BNDD BNDD number, like uh, which is which is like thing. narcotics, mm -hmm. Ativan. Stimulants mm -hmm. all goes into a record. So if somebody says, I want to have tramadol for my pain, and they've been on it, uh, and they are also, let's say, on clonopin and, and antidepressant and whatever else they want. These are uh, all part of the opioid picture. I was just about, so, so I would be able to go on to the um, a particular site that the government has. And I can look at all their medications that are, are BNDD controlled, okay? All the narcotics they've gotten, all the other, like, like the Ativans, the uh, stimulants that these people have gotten. So it's very easy. If I prescribe a narcotic, I go into this, into this site, and you can see all the other prescribers that have given the person the medication. So, uh, and I don't know exactly what happens, but there's a new thing that the pharmacies do. If they feel their pa the patients are on too much, quote unquote, uh, federally controlled medication, you have to have a license for that, uh, they, they will um, contact you and tell you. So it, that's a, those, both of those things are very helpful. And, um, but years ago, people would steal my prescription pads. And that, and, you know, that mm -hmm. one's not good. So, uh, but I think that, that the Fed has really, you know, clamped down. really clamped down on multiple prescriptions. So now most of it comes off the street. I would, you know, the prescription drugs will be coming off the street. 
uh, and many of the pharmacies now have been not allowed to give federally regulated drugs to their patients if they have if that particular pharmacy has given too many of those prescriptions in one year. So it is that's what that's what the Fed is doing. And we also have have to take an, uh, some training or had to over the last couple of years take some training so that we don't automatically give somebody narcotics if they have pain. We try to come up with other ways to deal with the pain. And actually psychotropic drugs for psychiatric conditions can be very helpful in managing pain. There's a drug called Cymbalta or Duloxetine, which uh, helps with pain as well as um, uh, depression. And there's some drugs that we use for depression, which are called tricyclic antidepressants, antidepressants um, that also are helpful for both pain and depression. So that's the best answer I can give. The rest of uh, that whole issue, uh, I don't know if I have anything more to say than anybody else. You know, what you see on television is a terrible problem. And people in this community have had, sadly, too many kids that have died of overdoses. So it's a very sad thing. And where they get them is a any mystery. Sometimes. I don't know. Well, well, here's the other thing. Where do they get them? They may get them out of their mother's or their father's mm -hmm. drug cabinet yeah. or off the street. Is really, mm -hmm. and that's because when when people get narcotics or let's say a surgery or whatever, sometimes mom or dad does not throw out the narcotic. You know? It's always important to get rid of your narcotics if you're not going to use it, so that nobody else. Mm -hmm. Lock them up when you're not using them. That's always a good idea. Yes. I just have a question. Uh, if we're talking to someone who does not seem depressed, but is, I think you said demoralized, yes. disheartened, because they have just been so many losses in their life, often due to aging or the oh, medical condition or the circumstances of their life. And just ideas for how to express our concern and love for them in ways that don't lead them more into depression. You know, just so that is a very that's an extremely good question. That's a, it's an excellent question. Very okay. Um, I like the serenity prayer for that because I think it kind of hones it down and allows you to have a, you know, you can, a, a more religious uh, approach to the thing. I, I think that usually what I say to somebody is, you have been through so much, I just can't imagine it. You know, that's my first class. And I know how difficult this has been for you. You know, I, and I'm so admiring of how well you have dealt with this this far. And it takes, and then often I'll go into, if it's a loss, like I go through the various kinds of things that happen when somebody loses somebody, the signs and symptoms of depression, I mean, of, of grief, you know, what's going to happen. That's a, that's a, lot, a lecture in itself, but, you know, what exactly happens, you know, after a month, after three months, and after, uh, after perhaps a year, you know, how, how the grief response goes, right? And then, you know, a person really has to then slowly, but surely, <laughs> begin to get back into life. And often social support helps, talking about it helps a lot, I think. And, but it's when you have you know, three losses, and then your heart, you know, you have to move into a nursing home, uh, a nursing home or a uh, facility uh, for, for all the people, uh, or, you know, taking somebody's home away is just horrible. 
So, and having to move to another city because to be near your children in a retirement facility because you no longer can quite take care of yourself. You know, all of these changes and all of the sad things that happen to people all the time, it's very hard. And I think, and I think being there and supporting them and encouraging them. The other question that I ask is, you know, you've been very resilient all your life. You've done very well in your life. Can you tell me when things were bad before, what did you do? That was a very important question. And um, is would that be helpful now? What do you think would be helpful now? In other words, and encourage them, but grief takes time. It takes readjustment. If you move into a retirement community, uh, you better be, because all people go downhill when they do that, have decreased function. That is where, not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> there, you can you know, to encourage them to go out and make friends and do the best they can to 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 uh, adjust to the retirement. Now, if the person decided to go there and uh, they wanted to go there and it wasn't somebody else that put them there, i.e. their children or somebody, uh, usually they're very happy with this because they've chosen it and feel positive about it. So does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie Kavanaugh for being with us today. Stephanie, on, on behalf of our Karen Cullen Ministry and when at Congregational Church, we present you with these flowers. To, uh, flowers. We are really blessed by your presentation. And it was a combination of medical information and a great deal of heart and commitment to the kind of ministry we do at Karen Cullen. Those of you who are on Zoom, uh, if you would like to stay on a few more minutes, uh, we're going to be just uh, giving a few words of thanks and a little word about Karen Calling Ministry before we meet. Uh, I'd like to also begin by thanking folks who have really helped us with this luncheon today. You see some of them on the move right now. Uh, Ann Walker is there and Sally Sprow, Eric Christensen. I think, Carol, did you bring some things too? Thank you, thank you. Yes, you brought yourself up. You brought mine up. Okay. And, uh, our co-chairs for Care and Calling are Sally Sproul and Eric Christensen. Members of the leadership team are Brian Homans, uh, Ann Walker, J.S. Hedigard, who's uh, joining us by Zoom, and Dr. Carol Jansen. Carol and I co-coordinate the details from week to week, day to day with Care and Calling. Also want to say a word of thanks to all the staff members who helped with Karen Calling generally and with this luncheon today, uh, uh, Pastor Jeff Braun, who's unable to be here, is always supportive of Karen Calling. Uh, your presence with us today, Tyler, is much appreciated in your support in this ministry. Also, I thank Patty Van Cleve, who's always behind the scenes doing great things. Uh, Don Huntsman, Edgar Aritzmendi, our custodian of uh, Valdeck, thank you for being here today. And um, also want to thank my neighbor, Carolyn Neer, whom you don't know. Uh, she made the chocolates that are before you today. Uh -oh. Stephanie, they, they really did come for you, but they're leaving for the chocolates. Is that the right way to say it? Um, it occurred to me that maybe if you are a Karen Calling Minister and you would like to take a chocolate to your care receiver, or two, maybe there's a household there, please do so. We have about 30 or so left over. Um, I can't stop you from taking more. <laughs> That's always a possibility. As we transition to a time of blessing for our meal, I want to say just real quickly how vital this ministry is with a very quick story about one care receiver and one care and calling minister. This is a care receiver who is homebound and whose family is distant, 
emotionally and physically. And it just became clear recently to Carol and me that this care receiver, probably her only outside visitor from the facility, outside the facility where she lives, is probably her care and calling minister from Winneka Congregation Church. The only person she sees from outside the facility is most likely her care and calling visitor from Winneka Congregation Church. Socialization, having a conversation with another human being who is not there because they're paid to be there as a staff person, but who is a representative of Christ, of Christ's love, of the congregation they have belonged to for decades, it means the world to them. And we have such a person, a care receiver. We actually have several care receivers on our care list who are would be much more socially isolated except for our care and calling ministers, you who are out there in the field doing this work. I just wanna say thank you for making such a big difference in their lives. Carol, did you wanna add something about that? I, I, you know, I'm so moved by so many of these stories. It, it's just incredible. We have, you know, we you don't always know all the stories that we know, but it's incredible. It's been an incredible experience. And that particular, that particular circumstance, that that person will not die alone because that person has the church and the care and calling ministry to them. And that should make us all feel. And we're not even certain of that particular individual, their family would even organize a memorial for her. So if the care and calling minister, you know who you are, care and calling minister has already come to Carol, Jeff, and me just to, to make sure that we could remember her when that time comes. Mm -hmm. to, get, to gather, it might not be a lot of people, but maybe some of the staff members from the care facility would like to be there. And those of us who know her uh, would certainly be notified to be there. But if it weren't for the Karen Calling Minister who sees her bringing this information back to Carol and me, we may not know exactly what's going on. I mean, that's how vital this ministry is, we really think. And I did talk to Jeff about that. Mm -hmm. And he said, we will have a service for her. But most of all, yes. we have to thank you for yes. all of your wonderful leadership to us. For you. Oh, the chocolate? No, 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 no. Well, you've got your own chocolate. I want to read what, the, what we are, the card we're presenting to him. Pastor Jeffrey, with your great appreciation for your commitment and passion, especially your passion. For Caring Calling Ministry, it wouldn't have been as strong without you. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. <laughs> we will miss you, but also excited for this next chapter in your life. And with this, we are presenting you with two tickets to Lear Capus West Side Story. Awesome. And a card. Uh, for dinner, Ooh. before the before the performance. How so kind now you'll finally fun. have some time to enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. That's unexpected, but so much appreciated. There have been so many people who have helped build the ministry of care and calling in the last five years. It hasn't just been me. It's been many, many hands. And most of those hands are in this room right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I thank you all.